Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second but first virtual Battle of the Books at Barrett Bookstore. My name is Paige Berger, and I am the marketing manager here at Barrett Bookstore, and we're so thrilled to welcome such um, a wide and enthusiastic crowd to our first ever virtual Battle of the Books. Uh, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Crowdcast, it is a webinar platform, so we cannot see you or hear you. We will be bringing the presenters up one by one as it is their turn to make their case. We've been in business for over 80 years, but uh, we are newbies in the virtual event realm. So bear with us if we have a little bit of a delay between presenters, but we promise you, you will get to hear from everyone tonight. Uh, we have 242 people registered. That is quite a crowd. In a moment, I'm going to introduce Jim Mustick, who will be our MC for the evening. Each of our five panelists will have a chance to present their book choice. At the conclusion of the presentation, you are going to see a poll at the bottom of your screen. You don't need to worry about it now. Jim will prompt you when it's time. And when that poll goes live, you will get to vote for your favorite book. Now, I know some of you may be sitting around the screen with your families, and yes, you are going to have to come to some sort of a consensus. Uh, there's only one vote per screen, but I think we've had a lot of practice at that in the last several weeks. So good luck. Uh, in terms of that's it in terms of housekeeping. Before I introduce Jim, I do want to offer up a sincere and enormous thanks to David Genovese and his team over at Baywater Properties and the Corbin District. They asked us to host this event and they are supporting so many innovative ways to bring us together as a community during this trying time. In addition, they're spearheading the incredible Corbin Cares Project, which brings healthy prepared meals to the food insecure in our community and also to healthcare workers on the front line. And we're very grateful that they asked us to be a part of tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jim Mustek. Jim, is the author of 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. He began his career in book selling at an independent bookstore in Briarcliff Manor, New York in the early 1980s. In 1986, he co-founded the acclaimed book catalog, A Common Reader, and for two decades was a deciding force. He subsequently has worked as an editorial and product development executive in the publishing industry. Jim, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're thrilled for the program, and I'm going to let you take it away. Paige, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and I'm very excited to see over 240 people registered for the event. Uh, I will admit it's a little unnerving to be speaking to so many folks I can't see or hear, uh, but here goes. I'll start by asking, how's everybody doing? And fortunately, since no one can respond to me, I found a good answer to that question. In Gail Honeyman's novel, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. It seems like a good quote to share in the current moment of our lives. If someone asks you how you are, you are meant to say, fine. You are not meant to say that you cried yourself to sleep last night because you hadn't spoken to another person for two consecutive days. Fine is what you say. So now I'm glad we're all fine and we'll move on with our program. It's wonderful to be invited back to Barrett Bookstore. This is the first virtual Battle of the Books for us as well. We had a wonderful in-person event at Barrett to help them celebrate their 80th anniversary last December. And I'd like to thank Sheila Daly and the rest of the Barrett team, especially Paige and Rosanna for inviting us back. Also thanks to the Corbin District team who instigated this virtual event. Hopefully next time we do it, we can all go out afterwards and walk around in the wonderful uh, ambiance and community that they've built uh, in downtown Darien. But tonight, we'll try to make this event as congenial and filled with good cheer as it was six, month, six months ago. I'm staring at myself on my computer as I've been doing on my day job for most of the past four weeks. And uh, staring at yourself on a screen 
uh, is not the best way to spend a day. In my youth, I might have thought of uh, George Orwell's remarks that at 50, everybody gets the face he deserves. But now that I'm 65, I uh, find myself looking at myself, thinking of Nora Ephron's book, I Feel Bad About My Neck. So thank you for putting up with looking at me. Um, let me quickly tell you about how these battles of the books came about. I spent a long time writing a thousand page book called A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die, which uh, in real life is not backwards like that. And when it was finally published in the fall of 2018, my wife Margo and I traveled around the country to more than 20 cities talking about the book in bookstores and at libraries. And the best part of all those events was the Q&A sessions afterwards with readers where people would talk about the books that they loved. And I quickly realized that having spent 14 books, writing, 14 years writing this book, I was going to spend the next 14 traveling around, having people tell me what I got wrong, what I left out, what should have been in it, and so on. But that fortunately is really uh, part of the fun for me. Those conversations are always the most engaging parts of the events. And my wife, Margo, had the very inspired idea at one point of saying, we should make this the event itself and go to a community, invite local people to talk about books that they love that aren't in the book and make that kind of conversation central to it. In the introduction to the book, I say that my book is not meant to be comprehensive or authoritative or prescriptive. It's meant to be an invitation to a conversation and a merry argument about the books and authors that are missing, as well as the books and authors that are included. For the question of what to read next is the best prelude to more important ones, like who to be and how to live. So let's get to it tonight. We have five contestants doing battle, Terry Wood, Jamie Stevenson, Beth Harmon, Alan Gray, and Greg Coles. I will introduce them one by one. We're going in reverse alphabetical order, and they will all speak for four minutes about a book that wasn't on my list of a thousand books that they think everybody should read. I will signal them gently when they have 37, 30 seconds left with a bell, and then I will signal them vehemently when the four minutes are up. After their presentations, I uh, will ask you to vote, as, as Paige indicated on the poll, and, uh, and we'll see who prevails. First up tonight is Terry Wood, Connecticut State Representative for the 141st District. Terry is ocean-loving, cookbook-collecting, Connecticut lawmaker. Ohio born and bred, she is proud of her Midwest common sense roots and loves life in Connecticut and believes that listening well, an always curious mind, and lots of love and laughter go a long way in life. What also goes a long way in life is good food, and she's going to talk about a wonderful cookbook called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by Samson Nazrat. Terry, take it away. Hi, I'm not Terry. <laughs> Uh, Terry's been invited, but uh, seems like she may have a pause on her end. So, Jim, let's go along to Jamie, and Terry will bring you on after Jamie. Okay. Hi. So, Jamie Stevenson has been a resident of Darien since 1991. She and her husband, John, who is a Darien native, have five children and one two-and-a-half-year-old grandchild. She grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania, and graduated from Arizona State University with a Bachelor of Science in Telecommunications and Business Management, and there she is. She was elected to the Darien Board of Selectmen and in 2011 was elected first selectman, only the third woman to hold the town's highest elected office. Additionally, she serves as Vice Chairman of the Western Connecticut Council of Governments, Chairman of Connecticut Interlocal Risk Management Insurance Agency, and second Vice Chair of the Connecticut Council of Municipalities. I'm glad you could find time to join us tonight to talk about Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui by Karen Kingston. Jamie, take it away. 
Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, I really appreciate Barrett Bookstore for hosting. So wonderful to support our local businesses, even in these really unusual times. And of course, to my good friend, David Genovese for everything that he's doing for the town of Darien. Um, so Terry's intro was really awesome and it was about all the things she loves. And you can see that my bio is a little bit dry <laughs> with all of my government involvements. But um, so this book might surprise you that I love this book, Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui by Karen Kingston. Um, no more, no better time than right now for thinking about things from the home front. And what can we do when we're at home, um, not able to connect with our family and friends? I love the genre of self-help. I, I find myself drawn to that all the time. How can I make myself a better person uh, and be a better person for the other people in my life? And this book came to me, it's gotta be 25 years ago, when we moved into our first house and it was a sad house. It was a house that, um, there was a lot of trouble uh, in the family who lived there before us, and I needed to make a wonderful environment for my brand new family. We had a new baby. So I just happened to pick up this book, and um, this book, what is feng shui? Let's start there. Feng shui, for anybody that doesn't know it, is the art of balancing and harmonizing the flow of natural energies in our surroundings to create beneficial effects in our life. And basically it's how your surroundings make you feel. Uh, if you look at that pile of bills that's piled up on your desk or those closets that you've pushed stuff into and just shut the door and forgot about for a long time, all those things weigh you down and bring negative energy into your life and don't allow you to be open to the more positive possibilities of your life. Um, so different kinds of clutter. There's paper. Um, I hesitate to say it, but some people um, have book clutter. They have collections of things that really don't resonate with them in their heart. They don't make them happy. They could inherit clutter from their family through uh, antiques or things that they don't really want or love. Um, and other people collect things because they say, I might need it someday. Or... Um, gosh, this thing reminds me of a time when in my life. Uh, sometimes people get bogged down with time clutter, putting too much on their plate, uh, and they really can't manage their schedules. And then finally, there's emotional clutter, where you hang on to old grievances or unhealthy relationships. So why in the world I needed this wonderful little book to give me permission to clean out those things in my life um, to open up my heart and my energies to all the positive, wonderful things that happen in everyday life. But I did, and I find myself referring back to this book all the time and reminding me that in order to invite the positive and the new into my life, I need to clean out all those things that really don't um, fill me with joy and love. So I hope that you'll take the time to read Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui by Karen Kingston um, and take from it what you will. And I promise you that it will make you feel just a little bit better every day. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate tonight. That was wonderful. And 30 seconds under the time limit. So well done. Thank you. And speaking of book clutter, if you could see outside the frame you're looking at now, you would see a lot of it. So that's a book that I'm going to have to get for myself. Now, Paige, are we going to go to uh, Terry now? Yes, we are. We're going to go to Terry in uh, one moment. I think we've got her. Here she comes. This is Terry Wood. She's going to tell us about Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by Samson Nazrat. While we're waiting, you may be familiar with um, the author of this book. There's been a series, I think, on Netflix of, of uh, many of the recipes. She talks about the four themes of the book, the four culinary approaches or flavors. 
that she organizes the book around and it's quite compelling. And the food is also delicious. So I can't wait to hear what Terry has to say about it. Jim, I think um, I think maybe we're having some technical difficulties with Terry again. So if okay. you give me a moment, we'll move on to Beth. I'm going to pull you up, and Terry will see you in a few minutes again. All right. I'm getting hungry, waiting for this description to move on. Beth Harmon has over 20 years' experience in domestic and international consumer brand sports and event marketing in both the for-profit and non-profit sectors. She credits her father for her passion for the written word. This passion grew a great deal during her, during her work at the New York Public Library, and she does not miss an opportunity to visit its vast reading room. She and her husband live in town and have three grown children. In, in addition to her extensive community outreach and service, she is a conservationist and executive director of the Darien Land Trust. She was runner up in our first Battle of the Books in person at Barrett in December when she championed John Irving's great novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany. And tonight she's going to talk about another great novel by the Portuguese master Jose Saramago called Blindness. Beth, nice to see you again. And you, Jim. And thank you, everyone at Barrett's. Thank you, David. Thank you to the panel. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. Blindness, that's right, by Jose Saramago. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature the year he wrote this book in 1998. So that's over 20 years ago. I read it. This is my original copy. And um, I cannot believe how relevant it is uh, for today. It is not a book for the faint of heart but the time we're going through is not for the faint of heart either. And if there's ever, ever a time to read this book, it is now. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a minute since we're talking about blindness. You might have your face mask nearby. You could cover your eyes, but I'm gonna read this very short passage right at the beginning of the book about the first man who's driving through a lot of traffic in an unknown city with a lot of honking, a lot of a lot of uh, people in a hurry to go places, and he suddenly goes blind as the light turns from red to green. And boy, are people annoyed because no one can get around him. So the honking goes on and on and on, and he's obviously distressed. I can't see, I can't see, he's yelling. Somebody finally sees he's in distress. They get him to the side of the road, get him out to the curb. Someone puts, says to him, now then, don't give it another thought. Today it's your turn. Tomorrow it will be mine. We never know what might lie in store for us. You're right, says the newly turned blind man. Who would have thought when I left the house this morning that something as dreadful as this was about to happen? And essentially, that's what has happened to all of us. And that's why you have to read this book now. It's extraordinary on three levels and how it, how it delivers something that we can all relate to. And that starts with the writing style. I'm going to hold up the book again. He writes with no quotations, no paragraphs. And that had nothing to do with it being translated into English. So you're in a stream of consciousness right from the start. You are in it. You are immersed. It's real. It's raw. The second thing that Brooke does brilliantly is the characters, the character themselves. In fact, the first man I read about, we don't come to know him as John or Jim. We come to know him as the first blind man. And that's how he's referred to for the rest of the book. And the third thing is the story itself. Oh my gosh, a plot that's a roller coaster of an adventure. Uh, which brings us to our protagonist, who happens to be the wife of the doctor who himself goes blind examining the first patient. She is reminiscent of our frontline workers right now, our unsung heroes. Uh, she is does not lose her sight, but has to pretend she's blind to accompany her husband and try to save, go on and save many countless lives. 
So she guides us through this tunnel, this tunnel of darkness and it's dark, but it gets better and there's light at the end and it's so worth the journey to go with her. And I promise you, I promise you this book offers light and inspiration and hope and that is what we all are desperately looking for right now. Thank you. Wonderful. Beth, thank you so much. That was Blindness by Jose Saramago. And Paige, what are we doing next? Yes. We're going to go to Alan. We're going to go Alan, Greg, and then we'll wrap up with Terry. So just figuring out a little bit of technical on her end. Excellent. Okay. So next up is Alan Gray, who is the director of the Darien Library. He served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam and graduated from Princeton University. Sad to say, he probably remembers more of the first book he ever read than he does of the last. But he's gonna to speak tonight about a book that is dear to my heart, not because I've read it, but it's the only book that ever got me out of a traffic ticket. Once I was stopped by a New York State trooper and I had three boxes of books on the back seat of my car. And he looked at them, he started talking to me and he asked me if I ever read a book that Alan's going to talk about now called Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. And he went on to spend 15 minutes telling me about how wonderful it was. Alan is going to give us four minutes and tell us about how wonderful it is. And I can't wait to hear it. Thanks very much. Yes, this is my copy of Anton Meyer's Once an Eagle. It is the best novel written about the American military in the 20th century. It is epic, it's sweeping, and it's beautifully written. And um, the first time you meet Sam Damon, who's the hero of the book, he's sitting in a small town in Nebraska and he is sparking his girl. He's middle class, she's the daughter of the banker, and they're talking about apple drop. From that point on, you follow him through the 20th century as he becomes America's premier warrior. This is a book um, that Anton Myra wrote as an anti-war book, but it's primarily thought of by the American military as the best way to look at leadership, character, and development. Sam Damon, um, think of him as Sam Elliott, who played him in a 1976 um, TV miniseries, is, uh, a fantastic man. He is a man's man. He's a woman's man. He first fights in World War I, where his courage and his aggressiveness uh, get him awarded the Medal of Honor. You follow him through his marriage to his wife, Tommy, to her fidelity and infidelity with him. You find his children um, and how little and how much they are like him. You see him in the Philippines in between the wars where he risks his career to help someone who is accused of a racial incident. You find him in World War II where he fights in one of the most beautifully written actions of military uh, the battle that you've ever seen. He goes to communist China during the middle of um, the communist revolution. And the book ends, this sweeping, beautifully written book ends in Vietnam in an oh my God moment. And through the book, you'll follow Sam Damon as he develops his character, this empathetic man who is both a warrior and someone who loves humanity. His alter ego, Courtney Massengale, who represents all that is negative about the military, the bureaucratic and political generals, and you see the yin and yang of that. And at the end of the novel, what you will have learned is something about someone that you wish you had known, that you love to have learned about, but you'll also see why the United States has been fighting in Afghanistan for 15 years and in the Middle East as well um, without resolution, because you'll see how the strength and weakness of the military plays out in this book. You find a fantastic character, a wonderful person uh, to read about. It's epic and it's sweep sweeping. And I recommend Anton Myers' Once an Eagle. I recommend it very highly. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alan. We're going to move on now to our fourth presenter, Greg Coles, the senior editor of the Books Desk at the New York Times and the poetry editor for the poetry editor for the New York Times Book Review, where he has worked since 2004. And he is going to talk about a book called The Journals of John Cheever, which is right up there on my shelf. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say about it. Greg. Okay, take it away. <laughs> uh, Jim thinks that you should read John Cheever's stories before you die. And he's right, they're beautifully made and unjustly forgotten and filled with a genuine love for the suburban life that he pokes fun at. In his stories and in his novels, Cheever was essentially a comic writer with an instinct for exaggeration and caricature, um, all grace and redemption shaded with a hint of trouble, like the splash of espresso that cooks use to make a chocolate cake taste even richer. But if you read Cheever and like him, then what you should really read before you die is his journals, because they are his masterpiece. They offer the same virtues as the fiction. He had an amazing eye and a musical ear, but they reverse the ratio. They're just espresso neat. It turns out that Cheever was tormented by drink, by lust, by loneliness, by spiritual yearning. And what carried him through all that was more than anything, his writing. You read the journals and you marvel that he was able to be a comic writer because he was a tragic man. You read them and sense how much he held back in his fiction, so much so that it makes the stories seem heroic in their cheer, but also a little flimsier forced. Um, you think that he spent so much time trying to be the Fitzgerald who wrote The Diamond as Big as the Ritz, when in fact he could have been Dostoevsky. Uh, they called Cheever the Chekhov of the suburbs, and he could have been the Dostoevsky of the suburbs. And then you realize that he was, and this is where he was. And through that tension, uh, the tortured psychology and the lyrical sentences, you see Cheever whole. I don't uh, mean to make the journals sound entirely bleak or unremitting. Uh, of course, you still get the redemption and the grace. You still get the suburbanite who loves cocktail hour and ice skating and Metro North. Um, maybe the best way to convince you to read Cheever's journals is to read you Cheever's journals because he sells himself. Is there anything more wonderful than the Monday morning train, the 822? The weekend, say a long summer weekend like the 4th, has left you rested. There have been picnics, fireworks, excursions to the beach, all the pleasant things we do together. On Sunday, we had cocktails late and a pickup supper in the garden. We see the darkness end the weekend without any regret. It has all been so pleasant. In the garden, we can hear from the west the noise of traffic on the parkway rise to a high pitch that it will hold until nearly midnight as other families drive back to the city from the mountains or the shore. And the sleeping children, the clothing hung in the back seat, the infinity of headlights, the sense we take from these overcrowded Sunday roads of a gigantic evacuation, a gigantic pilgrimage, is all a part of this hour. If I'm not mistaken, I saw this book um, on the bookshelves just behind Jim there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, read it before you die. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Jim and David and Barrett Bookstore. Wonderful. That's a, a, a marvelous description. I remember Mr. Cheever in the last year of his lives, life when, uh, when I was a very young man, He'd come in, uh, the bookstore I worked in in Briarcliff Manor was uh, near his home, and he'd come in and shop and uh, sign books for us. So um, uh, your evocation of the journals was uh, quite moving. Paige, are we ready with Terry? We are, we are hopeful. We are hopeful with Terry. Okay. Can you give us a moment? Maybe you want to start, um, if you want to talk about the poll and how that's going to work while we see if we can get her on and if we're not I, able I to. Think, um, I think that'll be, that'll be easier to, to do once people can see it on the screen. So 
Sure. Um, okay. I'll just riff a little bit about um, tell people about how they can uh, participate in this ongoing conversation we're trying to have about a thousand books. We've built a website called 1000booksToread.com. That's the number is 1000booksToread.com. And you can go on there and see my whole list, but you can also um, add a book of your own. So if you have a book like the Journals of John Cheever or Once an Eagle or the other books talked about tonight or any book that you have a particular fondness for that you think everybody should read, you can add it to the list and uh, it'll be on our website there. So that's at a thousand books to read.com where you can also sign up for the newsletter that I send out every two weeks that uh, talks about events like this that we have, about the books that readers are adding, new reading and writing that I'm doing. And you can sign up that uh, for that at the website and also participate in the ongoing conversation. Um, we also want to say that. Uh, my book and the five books that are talked about uh, in this event tonight are available from Barrett Bookstore. So you can, uh, Paige is going to give information about how to order them. Uh, if you would like my book with a personalized book plate, I'd be happy to sign it. It does make a good graduation present, I'll say. And um, any other book you're looking for, Barrett would be happy to provide. Um, What else can I talk about? Are we getting close, Paige? Hi, Jim. I think, unfortunately, we um, Terry's not able to connect. So we're uh, very sorry about that. We'll wait another moment. But what I'm going to do now is get the poll live. Um, and then that's going to be live on the bottom of the screen. So give me a moment to do that, and you can okay. talk a little bit about how that polling will work. The poll, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there should be beneath my picture a little green box that says get a copy of 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, and then ask a question and people. Uh, and the polling mechanism is going to appear down there shortly as soon as Paige gets it up. So, and then if you click on that, you will be uh, given the opportunity to vote for any of the four books that were talked about so eloquently tonight, or the fifth one that was mysteriously not talked about, but um, is quite tasty. So uh, we'll just wait for that poll to appear. There it is. You should see polls with a little circle and a red a red circle next to it saying one if you click on that red circle you'll be able to cast your vote so take your time make the best decision you can and we will go we'll see how we do Hi, Jim. While we're waiting for the poll to come in, we have a question. Someone's asking if you were going, planning to do more virtual battles of the books in other towns and cities. Uh, I would hope to if everybody thinks this went well. As I said before, it's hard to tell how we're doing without an audience. I've had a very good time. I think the contestants have. So we'd love to do more. I know we have several bookselling friends and librarian friends from around the country tuned into this one. So if we're asked, we will be delighted to do it. And if people want to know when we're having them, the easiest way to do that is to sign up for the newsletter at our website, and we will keep you posted. I'd hope to do many of these. Great. Thank you. And we're going to give people one more minute to vote. It's 7.35 on my clock. So when that turns to 7.36, Jim will have the honor of announcing the winner. All right.
All right, Jim. Please okay. do the honors. We have a winner, Beth Harmon with Blindness by Jose Saramago. So our runner-up from our last event is the winner tonight uh, with Blindness, a wonderful and powerful novel. Congratulations, Beth. And our runner-up is Greg Coles with the Journals of John Cheever. And Greg, as the runner-up, you get a spot in our next Battle of the Books at Barrett's, which we have scheduled already for December 20th of this year. So we'll hope you're available for that. Uh, and uh, what a fun night and terrific books and presentations. Um, it is uh, good to have company at times like these, a company of books and of readers. I'm grateful to all the contestants and to all of you who've been watching. And in these trying times, I'd like to close my portion of this before I flip it to Paige uh, with a little quote from a book uh, by a British philosopher named A.C. Grayling, who I've been thinking about lately, oddly enough, because he has the most perfect hair of any man I've ever met. And I've been wondering how he's doing without a barber because he has this magnificent quaff of hair. But in any case, I'm also thinking about him because I was reading in one of his books, looking for a passage I remembered that seemed apropos in the times we're living through now. So I'd just like to read that to you. And this is my friend, Anthony Grayling. Most people tend to think of courage as a warrior virtue, as belonging typically to battle, and therefore by analogy to endeavor on the upper slopes of Everest in the deeps of the sea, and even on the sports field. In other words, wherever endurance, grit, and determination in the face of physical challenges are required. That is true enough. But courage is often demonstrated because it is often needed in greater quantities in daily life. And there are even times when merely to live, as Seneca put it, is itself an act of courage. While mountaineering and deep sea diving are self-contained activities that last a certain length of time with, if all goes well, a return to a status quo ante when they are over, facing, say, grief or disappointment is quite different. They are open-ended, new, different dispensations with unforeseeables deeply embedded in them, promising only that much will have to be born before relief comes. To lie sleepless with pain at night or to wake every morning and feel the return of grief, yet to get up and carry on as best one can is courage itself. That's Anthony Grayling. For my part, I'll add, be strong, be well, read good books, and support your local bookstore. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paige to tell you how to do that. Thank you all so much. Jim, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Jim's wife, Margot, who is behind the scenes and is an extraordinary force in helping to organize these events. Um, it was really our pleasure to have you with us. And to those of you whose interest was piqued by the titles that were presented tonight, Barrett Bookstore remains closed um, in terms of being able to come into the store, but we are able to offer, uh, we call it backdoor pickup, no contact. We offer free home delivery in Darien and Rowayton, and we can ship beyond Fairfield County. We are open between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. for phone assistance if you need some live help, and you can also place orders on our website. Again, thank you so much to Jim. Thank you to David Genovese for suggesting we do this event, and thank you to all of you for coming out. We hope you have a wonderful night. Good night.